Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Chit Heads. My guest today is Zach Dasik. Integrating 15 years of interdisciplinary bodywork, yoga, and anatomy studies, Zach Dasik developed conscious embodiment. This teaching is an experiential and holistic anatomical study blending postural analysis with innovative fascia movement. Zach has created anatomy curriculum and manuals for yoga programs and students all over the United States, including renowned teachers Skylar Grant, Nikki Costello, and Amy Wren. Since 2002, Zach Dasik has maintained a successful bodywork practice informed by kinesis myofascial integration, shiatsu, fascial manipulation, and yoga. He is a licensed massage therapist, registered yoga teacher, and member of the International Association of Structural Integrators. Zach is grateful for the inspiration and wise mentorship of his teachers, including Thomas Myers, Gil Headley, and Elena Brower. Through his studies, Zach has explored yoga, Pilates, gyrotechnic, gyrotonic, <laughs> African dance, and martial arts. So with that, hello, Zach. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, Jacob. So I wanted to um, talk a little bit just to start about your life, and perhaps you can tell us the story of what brought you to this deep and and deep investigation of the body, and, and specifically a holistic approach to the body. Well, the story begins, I was about 14, and I sprained my ankle playing soccer, and... Um, my best friend's father approached me, offering me acupuncture, and, you know, being the teenager that I was, I wow. told him to... <laughs> yeah, you can curse. <laughs> I told him to go to hell. You're not sticking needles in me. <laughs> and um, and uh, after two weeks of sitting there doing nothing, I decided to participate in the acupuncture, which basically healed me in five weeks. Whoa. And I, at 16? At, at 14. At 14, wow. 14, yeah. And... I was I learned and asked a tremendous amount of questions about what was acupuncture, what were these philosophies, and I fell in love. I mean, it changed my life and um and and made me realize that I was normal. Mm. Uh I was given a, a book about Taoism mm. and I and I'd been having these thoughts and feelings and exploring these ideas and I thought I was insane until I was given this book of Taoism, which I was so surprised to find out that people had been thinking about these things for thousands of years. Wow. And I knew that this was where I belonged. This was who I was going to be for the rest of my life. That's pretty incredible that you were kind of steeped in these ideas from a very early age, because for me personally, I, I didn't even discover these ideas probably until I was in college. It just wasn't in the kind of cultural milieu of where I grew up. So can you explain like a little bit about, uh, like is, was your family just kind of more attuned to this kind of thinking, or was it other people in your life who, who offered these teachings to you? Yeah, so I think my parents were just a very normal small town USA kind of folk and I was just lucky enough that um, a, a kid moved into my town from Austin and mm. his parents were acupuncturists both of them oh wow um, and in fact we were we were enemies when we first met and it was through the need to heal with the acupuncturist that I, I really, that we became best friends and that I became, that this whole world sort of entered my, my thought process mm. and my heart. Mm. Yeah. And when did you first become a body worker? So, you know, I, my goal when I, I, I kind of figured out when I was 16 what I wanted to do. I, I, I realized that I, I loved working with my hands. I loved listening to people. I loved holistic medicine. I loved the philosophies. Mm -hmm. So I went to college. I studied psychology. And then um, in 2002, when I graduated, I went to massage school. Mm -hmm. I went to the Swedish for two years. Uh, when I left there, I had a mentor for three years, uh, this Chilean woman um, really taught me the anatomy with my hands, mm. really put um, the body and the healing properties of the body into my understanding. Mm -hmm. um, and that's when I began after that, I would say, to study with Gil and, and Tom. Mm. Mm. 
So speaking of um, anatomy in your hands, you offer an incredible course that I actually had the pleasure of, of taking myself. Um, it was called a conscious embodiment, wasn't it? Yeah. And uh, and I remember the first the first day. You know, you offered kind of an introductory day where you talked about kind of the philosophy and the history of anatomy, and you explored an idea that I thought was really radical and really was very transformative for me, I, and, I, and I think will be for a lot of people when they hear you discuss it, and, and, and that is this, st- the, the idea of anatomy as a story that, we, that we've told, and, and that story, especially in the Western context, has been associated with a certain kind of history and a certain kind of scientific trajectory, so I would, I would love for you to kind of take us on that adventure of history and to Talk to us a little bit about that story and what it means for anatomy to be a story. Sure, sure. Um, when you when you look at the history of anatomy, you know the beginning of the study of the body was largely controlled by the church in Europe, mm-hmm. from a Western you know perspective, through the Western lens, and and that you know was regarded with. Um, with sacrilege and and breaking the law and mm. you know going underneath the skin was it, it just wasn't it was it was just uncouth uh, mm. you know and um, it wasn't until the 1700s you know after uh, you know in the Renaissance after you know massive plagues had uh, killed millions of people all across Europe that. Individuals were were they're getting jittery, and they wanted to know what was happening, and they wanted to have the ability to study the body, study the human form uh, legally. Hmm. And um, you know, before this, before this time, the study of anatomy took place with grave robbing in mm. the middle of the night in the winter because you didn't want to do it in the summertime. Right. <laughs> and, um, and, and it was done illegally and quickly. And so our understanding and our thought process around the body was, was done through artists and physicians behind closed doors. Underground. Underground, yeah. And, um, and it wasn't until um, a, a bunch of physicians, a, along with the help of... Um, uh, Rene Descartes, who's a philosopher, who was also involved in politics, who was a writer, and you know, he he, he was a Renaissance person, a, a man of, of many things, mm-hmm. um, and um, they went to the church and said, "Listen, like you can have the spirit, you can have the mind, but we need the body, we mm-hmm. need the soft machine," you know, and that was sort of taking from um, you know Da Vinci's ideas that the body is a soft machine and. And, mm. and and so they were using these arguments to to explain to the church that look like we've got to figure out what's going on with the human body so that we can really begin an intelligent approach to healing and, mm-hmm. and understanding how to facilitate healing. Mm-hmm. Um, and the the church said okay, and that was the beginning of um, of, of the study of anatomy. Mm. It, it's really important to understand the, the context of the time. You're, you're talking about Renaissance people, right? You're talking about an age of human beings that an, that believed in having access to multiple spectrums of society at any given time. They they cared about holistic ideas and concepts as a as a as a foundation mm-hmm. for their thought process, it's, it's essentially an age of um, the beliefs that hippies, you know, brought forth, and and that we, you know, we talk about holistic concepts and ideas today. But really, this is this is just a cycle, mm-hmm. um, and you know, these these people in the beginning of the legalization of the study of of the human form. They, they had to approach it. You know, they had to begin somewhere. They had to decipher the mess that was underneath. You know, under the skin, um, and and so reductionism becomes this 
clear, sensical, you know, choice to deciphering what is inside the body and what is reductionism. Reductionism is breaking down the body into smaller and smaller parts Mm -hmm. so that we can get a sense of, you know, the tree trunk and the leaves and the branches and the seeds and the roots. But something happened through Mm -hmm. that process, Um, through the process of, of studying the human form and individual parts, we forgot about the continuity that is life. We forgot about the the vibrance that is a human being, you know? And, and we've got sucked into these classrooms studying anatomy through this reductionist lens of repeating, you know, six the name of 608 muscles and and both of their attachments to protuberances on you know 214 bones and and you're just dizzy you know you're you've lost the context for the fact that you're literally studying the form that you embody Mm -hmm. you know And, and who wants that you know what's the point you know and i and i get it i understand that that reductionism has played a really important and influential role in our understanding of the human form. But if you look at the development of modern, you know, Western medicine, you you can see that the expression of reductionism has been magnified so greatly that we have doctors who are focused on individual body parts. Mm -hmm. They've been reduced to individual parts of the body. To the point where you have a pulmonologist and a cardiologist who, you know, exist in completely different offices and parts of a hospital or, or our society. And, and yet, can you be any more closely related in the body but, but between the lungs and the heart? I mean, they literally dance between each other, you know, every breath, every heartbeat. It, it's, you know, and, and, you know, when we, we come from this more holistic side when we reach back to what i believe the renaissance people intended for us to do you catch a glimpse of holism you catch a you not a glimpse you 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 catch a you know a, a sledgehammer of relationships right these people lived with connectivity in in the very fabric of their daily lives and and to me I, I think that when they began the study of anatomy, they 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 got lost in reductionism because there was just so much to tackle, so right. much to understand. But their main, my belief is, their intentions and their their purpose was to bring it all together, mm-hmm. and and that's the kind of anatomy that I've fallen in love with. That that I've you know, imparted in these teacher trainings and in this, this course, Conscious Embodiment, is this understanding of the human form and all of the reduced pieces and all the hard work that the Western medical system has put forth, right? It's not wasted. It's not, you know, this evil entity that, that we're fighting against, per se, even though the medical system isn't necessarily in the form that I would like to see it in mm-hmm. and many people would like to see it in. And and you can see that, right? You can see that that society is voting for holistic medicine with their dollars, right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, looking at this development of of anatomy into a more holistic form that that the Renaissance folk wanted to you know, bring the idea of reductionism and, and create these these holistic understanding of the different systems that exist inside our body. It just seems like the logical development of medicine going forward mm-hmm. to me. Yeah. Wow, that's such a fascinating and important um, story that you're telling. And and when you were talking about just at the end about the medical establishment, so is it safe to say then that kind of a legacy of this reductionism is a, a specialized approach to the body in which we think about a problem of the heart as if it can be spoken about separately, that this is kind of the the paradigm that we're in where we 
where we see a problem, it's like, oh, I have pain in this region of the body. That that means I need to address this specifically, and and therefore I don't necessarily um, look at or think it's necessary to think about the 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 number of relationships that are involved that could be located in other parts of the body or have started or. In fact, you you talk interestingly. I remember in your course about 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 this idea that nothing starts in a specific place; that it's always in a web of relationships. So, anyway, I threw some stuff out there, but I don't know if you want to kind of respond to that um, in terms of kind of what what the the legacy is um, right now, and uh, and what holism holistic understandings are kind of responding to. Well, I think medicine has evolved genuinely to try to help people. Yeah. I, I just think that the the paradigm, the reductionist paradigm has sort of lent itself to this A plus B equals C kind of you know research or or hunting for to understand you know what is disease what is health and and I, I think at the same time that that happens um, it it develops this concept of of pills this this concept mm-hmm. of quick fixes and you know people's need for immediacy you know our our fear of the unknown, the fear of not knowing, you know, and, and the medical system has largely existed in this shroud of mystery, right? Mm-hmm. This, this, you know, this other language, this, you know, it's, it's spoken in Latin, you know, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's hell, you know, and, and that, that doctors are studied and they are, I mean, they are the amount of anatomy and the amount of information that you have to tackle and absorb and digest as a, as a doctor is tremendous. And, right. But the, the concept of like a diagnostician and a, you know, sort of matching a diagnosis with a, a pill or a, or a, a magic potion that's going to, you know, make the change that's going to lead us to health. It's sort of, it eliminates the natural tropisms that that we have as humans towards health. Mm-hmm. You know, our bodies are constantly striving for equilibrium, balance, health, and, you know, success. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and that's... That's something that medicine is sort of left behind. The, this idea of preventative medicine yeah, that yeah. we've had to, we've had to, you know, sort of force it upon ourselves, or, or you know, find you know that information on our own, and and it comes from experience, you know, mm-hmm. and it comes from wisdom, and it comes from, you know. Um, from within, mm-hmm. you know, and, and to me, the more interesting question is what's stopping my body's natural processes from functioning properly? You know, mm-hmm. that's a more interesting answer to me. And that, that arises, the answers to that arise when you start to look at how the different parts of the body relate to each other. Mm-hmm. So, you know, physical medicine has sort of gotten left behind because physical medicine is is you know it's been it's been held up by uh, chiropractors and kinesiologists and uh, physical therapists you know but the you know traditional gps and other doctors really aren't focusing on physical medicine they're focusing on pharmaceutical medicine mm-hmm. and di- diagnosis and surgery kind of medicine and that's the the bulk of you know, the Western paradigm up mm-hmm. to this point. Physical medicine has sort of gotten left behind. Um, and that's sort of where, you know, we come in, where the yoga teachers and the Pilates teachers and the physical therapists and the, the chiropractors and massage therapists and, you know, all of the, the development of more holistic practices, um, endobiogeny is a mm-hmm. fantastic new form of medicine, functional medicine, 
doctors are, you know, are developing, you know, with these kind of thought processes, with these relationship-based anatomies and mm-hmm. concepts with disease and how the different systems of the body are communicating with each other and and interacting to create, you know, the cities, the internal cities, the working, the well-oiled stories that, that develop our health. Mm-hmm. Wow. So... What I hear you saying uh, is that the the kind of approach to um, to the body where we would prescribe, you know, maybe you know some kind of external medication, is denying the truth. And tell me if you agree with this that that the body holds within itself uh, all of the tools that it needs, or almost all of the tools that it needs to heal itself in most instances, and doesn't require the kind of external prescription necessarily is that correct i i don't know i can't answer that definitively nobody can answer that definitively right right we we're not there yet mm. um but i i think that it funnels into you know health being a product of healthy wholesome diets exercise in a multitude of different ways, you know, having healthy movement in our lives and, you know, um, sleep, play, love, mm-hmm. like all of these things are, you know, contribute to our health um, and, and aren't necessarily held within the context of, you know, traditional medicine. Mm-hmm. It's not to say that we don't need Support and help from you know supplements or prescriptions even at right. time to times because we do yeah um, you know but I I definitely feel like the balance of that mm-hmm. has been tipped in a, a profit oriented yeah. way instead of a health oriented way right right. So you mentioned physical therapists, and this is actually a question that I had, and I hadn't intended to ask it, but I, I, uh, I, I, and I know that there are physical therapists, as there are all practitioners that represent, you know, the the wide gamut of of approaches from you know a holistic physical therapist to, you know, maybe a traditionally um, educated physical therapist, whatever that means. But um, I'm curious what the f- what the difference is between. In general, you know, what a physical therapist does versus kind of a holistic body worker in terms of um, prescriptions or, 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 um, or offerings as to ways to approach issues in the body. Because I know that for myself, I've, I've, I've gone to a physical therapist before, and it felt a very compartmentalized. It was like, okay, this is obviously where it's happening, therefore you need to do this. And then they gave me, you know, some rubber band and then told me that I had to do 10 of these, you know, repetitive movements every day. And it felt very isolated. And in a way that kind of like... Uh, 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 Harkens back to what we were talking about with kind of the wasn't meeting you precisely, yeah. but meeting the part of your body, right? As opposed, yeah, yeah. You know, I I want to answer that question by sort of talking about the body a little bit and Great. talking about the balance between strength and flexibility, the balance between um, stability and range of motion. You know, and you know that. To recognize the body as a series of pulley systems, as a series of slack lines and super tight areas, Mm. locked short or locked long, right? Overly engaged or um, completely ignoring parts of ourselves, right? Have you ever been in a, in a yoga class or a movement class where you've been asked to do a particular task with your body and it almost feels like you're trying to bend your mind around mm. the instruction and, and sometimes it takes weeks before you can harness that, you know, ability. And, and so there are parts of ourselves that we've sort of developed an amnesia to. Right. And so when I look at holistic medicine through the idea of holism with when it applies to the physical body to a physical medicine i'm looking at the 
muscles, the fascia, and the bones, the soft tissues in relationship to the with the bones, and the balance between strength and flexibility, stability and mobility, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and and having um, balanced actions and behaviors in my life that allow for a smooth and even distribution of stress and strain amongst the pulley systems. Mm. Okay? Mm. That that to me is is part of the health of the physical body. Right? And so physical therapists in my opinion are working more toward the strengthening and the stability side of things as is a pilates um, pilates is also uh, trying to help recruit and awaken certain areas in the body um, as well as physical therapists mm-hmm. uh, and strengthen weaknesses you know um, whereas like uh, certain manual Massage therapists, fascial, you know, body workers um, are working more to differentiate and mm-hmm. open areas that are too tight. And I feel as though uh, in a perfect um, physical medicine practitioner, you would have the development of both of these mm-hmm. skills within the same practitioner, someone who has the ability to recognize when strength is needed, when stability is needed, and the ability to call for them in a specific location, as well as the ability to differentiate tissue and, um, you know, create space where it's needed. And, Mm -hmm. And that, in turn, becomes a process that the individual who needs the healing is participating in, mm-hmm. right? That it's not just something that can be done to you, right. but that's something that that we participate in together. Mm. And in that way, we can utilize the um, the effort and work that's grown in hundreds of years of studying reductionism and include it in a more holistic thought process to develop and facilitate health in the human form. Mm. Mm. So you mentioned this word um, a few times now, I I believe, fascia and fascial. And um, one of the things that I learned in your course was kind of the importance of fascia in understanding this holistic um, web of relationships that is the body. Uh, But I also found it very interesting that it's not been considered very important in kind of the history of anatomy. Um, So I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about fascia and how it's kind of a new thing a little bit. You know, it's not a new thing, obviously, but it's new to kind of look at it as important to discussing the interconnectedness of the body. Yeah. Yeah, so um, the fascia is this wonderful substance, and it's gone... Into the buckets, <laughs> into the, it, it's been disposed of in, in the human form for the bulk of the study of Western anatomy. Uh, so has fat, mm. um, and in in that way, um, there's some dogma in the science, right? There's some uh, scientists that are choosing because they either don't want to include or they don't understand the value of these substances to to the human health, you know, um, and and just kind of tosses them aside to get to what they deem is more important. And and in that way, I feel like our model, our reduced model is still lacking, you know, the holism, Mm -hmm. you know, it's it's lacking a, a lot of pieces and parts. And and what's interesting about fascia is fascia becomes the fabric that um, surrounds your bones. You know, it surrounds your muscles. It surrounds your individual fibers. It mm. surrounds your organs. It becomes, 
it creates the tunnels through which your nervous system and vasculature travel through the body. It becomes the scaffolding for all of the systems and objects that exist inside of you. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, it reaches through every cell. You know, it, it, it connects every single cell on a microscopic and a microcosmic level mm -hmm. as well as the macrocosmic level of the body. It, it essentially fills in the space between and becomes the webbing that maintains the integrity of the structure while allowing for the freedom to adjust to the movements that we ask our bodies to achieve on a regular basis. Mm. It's the fabric that in the beginning of a movement class creates this stiff, sticky feeling inside of our bodies and then through the hour or 90 minutes of, of exercise transforms into a more fluid-like substance. Mm. It, it has the ability to adapt and change and, and, and when it turns into a fluid-like substance, it become, our bodies feel more free mm. and we feel more flow mm. inside of our systems. Um, and in that way, fascia is, is also a colloid. It's like jello. When it's warmed, it's more fluid-like, and when it's cooled, it's more gel-like. It's more hardened mm. inside the system. And, mm. and in that way, it has the ability to sort of adjust and contain all of the different structures that exist mm. uh, inside of us. So uh, then what, what I'm hearing a little bit is that the, the kind of common idea is that if I'm tight in a certain area, it's because my muscles are tight. But in a lot of cases, is it true that when you're tight, it's actually fascia? It's like a... Well, you know, if, if fascia is the jello mold, mm. then muscle becomes the jello, mm. right? And most of the time, the muscles are going to sort of adapt to the casing of the fascia. You know, imagine a, um, a sausage link, you know, mm. or like a link of sausages. You know, there's the, the intestines that surround the meat and, and the meat is encased inside the tissue and, and there's linkage of them. You know? And that's, that's not too dissimilar from the story that exists inside of the body, that mm. there's this continuity of muscle fibers that are surrounded and encased in fascia that come together at the end, those, those tubes that surround the muscle come together to form a tendon. And then that tendon tacks down to the fascial bag that surrounds the bone. And then it emerges again as a tendon and, and opens up to the next muscle and so on and so forth. And that, that, that train, that, that path of myofascial continuities becomes the whole system mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that drapes over the bone structure. Mm. And it's the relationship between those muscles and that soft tissue, that fascia and the, the bone that, um, that create a tensegrity, an integrity, a tension and a compression relationship that allow for levity, for uprightness, yeah. right? It's like a spider web, essentially. And, you know, the relationships in that spider web dictate how tension and movement is translated through the system, you know? And, and so our muscles are tangled in the spider web and the bones are tangled in the spider web and and as we move through the world the movement and the vibration and sensation sort of vibrates through the mu the muscles the myofasciculature the myofascial you know skeletal system you know as a as a behavior and in that way Muscles and bones are suspended in the soft tissue network. Mm. They float mm. inside of us, mm. you know? So, you know, when you, you look at, at muscles, there are times when muscles get tight and 
um, and we do want to stretch them out, you know, mainly that's like in a muscle spasm or something like that. But most of the other time, it's the tubing, it's the fabric around the muscle that's gotten compressed, overstretched, um, and, and it creates pressure on the musculature, on the joint system, on the bone system. And it's, it's the unraveling, the balancing of strength and, and releasing tension in that pulley system that allows for alignment in our structure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's it's interesting because as you're responding to my question, your response is 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 reflecting kind of this interconnectedness that you have been you know sharing about the body this whole interview, and then I and then I realize in my question it's so hard to get away from this. It's like I asked the question like is it one or the other, and your answer was like well it's both, and then you went it took us on this journey of like how it all links together, and it's it's just interesting that compulsion that we have to kind of want to know is it this or is it this rather than understanding and being able to speak about it in this kind of relational way you know it's the the development and the growth of a dynamic thought process mm. you know the the willingness to say we're still at the beginning you know there's so much more that we don't know that 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 we've got so many building blocks. We have so many different parts to the, you know, to put together and understand the relationships, you know, it's, it's, you know, one of the most common things about the cold is that we, you know, we go to heal it through symptoms, right? We heal it through drying out our faces, you know, so that there's no more runny nose or, or, you know, throat or, you know, you know, Clogging, you know, we're we're focused on the face, but the truth is, is that if we heal our gut, if you heal your stomach, you're going to heal the cold so much faster, mm. you know. So, so recognizing how the body, the body's parts, participate in systems, and how we can facilitate that healing process, you know, it, it's tremendous. I mean, I, you know. I can literally eliminate sugar and dairy from my body. And when I do that, I barely ever get sick. Mm. And then I can just cheat a little and I can have that cookie and I can have that <laughs> cheese. And strangely enough, I'm fighting something, you know, and mm. it's just mm. really interesting how, OK, there's a relationship between my gut and my diet and my immune system and my yeah. body's ability to, you know, manage the things that are around all the time that my body really can slough off yeah. when it's when I'm taking care of all of the systems as a whole. I love that you just uh, basically said that my two favorite things in the world, cookies and cheese, are are contributing to my <laughs> lack of well being. I, I said that it's contributing to mine. <laughs> okay, I'm not. I'm not speaking for the rest of the world. I mean, I, I, I'm. You know, I think it's important that when we learn about health, mm. that we, you know engage in a process of recognizing our own stories right you know and that that you know you know Gil one of my teachers one of the things that he he's participated in dissecting over 300 forms mm. you know and what he says is that he's seen something different in every single form in every single cadaver that he's never seen in any other form that's ever existed right you know so where we you know anatomy is the summary of a few forms mm -hmm. it's you know at best it's you know 40 bodies you know 40 a, a sample of 40 people from you know one spot on the planet in time you know and so it's this isolated understanding of what a human being is right there we've lived at many different times and the food that we were eating you know just 30 years ago is very different than the food that's on the shelves in your you know grocery store today so right. you know when we're studying anatomy and and the average book has only five to ten forms in it right so mm. if we're we're really we're 
making generalizations about the population and how the body works um, based on the summary of a few individuals taken out of a certain place in a certain time. And to me, that's a good start. It's a great start. It's yeah. what we have, right? But health becomes this... relationship that we participate in, this consciousness that mm-hmm. we participate in with ourselves, mm-hmm. you know, that, that how much attention am I going to put in my life to understanding what my body actually needs? Mm-hmm. You know, some people, I've met people who exercise often and they look, they're 60 years old and they look like they're 40, mm-hmm. you know, and they're in great shape. However, their body, their fascia, their tissue is so responsive, which keeps them young, but it also tightens so hard and mm-hmm. fast that mm-hmm. they actually need to have more of a range of motion and flexibility uh, regimen to their exercise diet. Right. As opposed to, you know, other people who... Um, if they don't exercise, they feel like they're going to go nuts. They feel like the hormones that are getting old inside of their bloodstream and their fluid systems are interacting on a cellular level, and they need to flush that immediately Mm -hmm. or else they can't survive. And that's a real difference between people. You know, we all have tendencies toward our own individual help. And unless we begin the process of participating in understanding the relationships that exist in our own individual bodies, we're never going to to really understand what health is and what enjoyment is in, right. in utilizing the human form on a daily basis. Right. So it's it's in a sense offering tools to kind of understand from inside that is that is going to provide a certain kind of wisdom that will never. Um, can't be really realized from an external perspective. Like a, a practitioner can look at a at a body, but um, but there's a, there's a, there's a necessary there's a necessity for um, from both sides to develop a kind of wisdom together. It's it's really the opposite of how our society has become. You know, we are sort of reliant upon everything external mm. to care for us and. And what I'm talking about is a self-responsibility. Right. You know, it's, it's, a, it's you know, utilizing facilitators, utilizing healing practitioners and doctors as a sounding board for developing your own responsibility to, to, to support your natural tropisms towards health. You know... Doctors and 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 healers help us to unravel the pieces that we don't understand. Right? We, as facilitators, take dedicate our lives to trying to help people. You know, key into the stories that exist mm. inside of them. You know, for me, like I'm in a way, I'm very much as a as a, my practice is very different than. A doctor. A doctor will, you know, diagnose and give you something, and and we sort of look at that exchange as what health and healing is. Yeah. And when I when people come to me, I have to slowly guide them to an understanding that healing and health is an everyday responsibility. Mm-hmm. It's an ongoing process, mm-hmm. like brushing your teeth and flossing for the dentist, you know, and keeping your teeth healthy, like, you know, eating well and exercising and enjoyment and having play. I mean, these are all, you know, sharing, giving love, mm-hmm. you know, is just as important to to maintaining the health inside of your system as, you know, taking your vitamin D and, you know, eating a a balanced diet and getting seven and a half hours of sleep a night, Mm. you know? Yeah. So, you know, I guess in summary of that, you know, if we were to develop an understanding in our children, um, 
about the importance and the value of a balanced physical medicine. Mm-hmm. A, a, um, a, you know, to instill in our children a, an inquiry as to what health means for them. Mm-hmm. You know, at, if, we, if we were given this at a young age, it would be second nature to us. Right. Instead of having to break down the thought process that pieces and parts and, you know, finding that missing puzzle piece pill is going to be the healing, you know, sequence that I need to finding health, right? The, the traditional Western medicine way has has got us reliant upon that as opposed to, you know, developing an education system and a process through which, you know, we can grow an understanding of our own healing and health process mm-hmm. as individuals from a young age. By the time we get to adults, it's, right, we've got it. It's, mm-hmm. it's, it's in you then. And we don't have to break anything down anymore. Yeah. Yeah. There's no profit there, though. Right. Yeah, that's true. And it's interesting that, you know, what I hear you saying is that we, there's a part of the, the healing process actually is culturally kind of recovering from an addiction to a socialized dependency on on um, external prescriptions and somebody else sort of telling us what's wrong with us and not and necessarily giving us the tools to um, to work from within, like you're saying. I don't think it's as sinister as that, though. You know, I <laughs> I, I think it's I think it's become more sinister. Yeah. But I think that that our arrival in this place was came from a genuine place of doctors wanting to right. help. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the and, intention wasn't to. But yeah. and I think that there's a you know that profit in relationship to healing and health is a very dicey path to totally. walk. Um, and, and it's very, you know, at this point in our history, the money has the power. Yeah. But what's interesting is that people have also been voting with power, you know, mm-hmm. and billions of dollars are spent out of our pockets, even though we're, we're still participating in this physical, this, Western medicine practice, we are voting with our dollars for other kinds of healing and health. There just hasn't been a central movement around the shift, Mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and I think in, you know, a a concerted education process for the youth, um, that's, holistically driven with meditation, breathing, movement, diet, sleep, consciousness, you know, and some, and the development of our understanding of the physical body, you know, to include some of these ideas, healthier ideas around fascia and fat and fluids, you know, we can, we can, we totally have the ability and the wisdom and the building blocks to develop the next phase of what will become medicine, health, and healing. Mm -hmm. Do you think that that's an inevitable development? Do you see that happening? Well, I see a lot of things happening. I mean, I see genetics and DNA and mutation and, you know, and, and that world happening. And I see, you know, the the finer tuning and development of surgery occurring mm-hmm. and, and um, you know, pills are not without value in the right situations. I mean, I, I think that, I think that there are movements and there are developments. I, I, I don't, I can't pretend to foresee the future, but mm. I can engage in taking responsibility for, you know, spreading information that will facilitate the development of a new form of consciousness around healing and health. And mm-hmm. I, look, look around New York City. I mean, look at all of the holistic practitioners that have a very strong foundation and a firm foothold, you know, and make healthy lives yeah. in one of the, you know, most rigorous cities and experiments on the planet, you know? So it's here, just, it's not, um, 
everywhere else. It's not it's not <laughs> as organized as the AMA, right? Yeah, the American right. Medical Association is yeah. or something like that. Yeah, totally. Okay, I kind of want to rewind a little bit and ask you something that kind of came to me when you were talking about um, warming up fascia. And, and this is kind of a controversial question, perhaps maybe in, in some parts of the yoga community, but I remember seeing an article about static stretching and how static stretching actually is not healthy for the body because it can actually reduce flexibility. And I know that for me personally, in a yin class, it's performed very traditionally where you kind of like, you don't warm up the body at all. You just kind of like, you know, in a, in a wide leg forward bend for five minutes. It hurts me. Like it's, my body is naturally tight and I have to really move my body and get you know, viscous, if that's, is that the word? Viscous? <laughs> so I'm curious what your thoughts are on, on the kind of, you know, because people do yin differently, but um, some people do yin at the end of classes when the body is warm, but this idea of like coming to a class and just doing a static pose before the body is warm, static stretching before the body is warm, is that problematic? It depends. Mm. You know, um, Different bodies need different things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can become, you could be static in a chair pose, for instance, mm -hmm. you know, and that's quite warming yeah, to totally. the body and can More begin plank. the process of stretching at the same time. I mean, I, I, I do, I am a proponent to warming the form before making changes to it, but only because it's, um, there's this graceful entry into communicating with the body that the nervous system, you know, get the nervous system on board, get the muscles on board, get the fascia on board, get the bones and the joints, you know, on board and, and get the body in sync, mm -hmm. you know, get your mind and your consciousness and your breath engaged in the process, your consciousness being like your mindfulness in the movement and the way that you move um, and connecting you know with your intention you know what are you trying to do are you trying to strengthen this area are you trying to stabilize this area are you trying to stretch this area so um, and you know if you're telling me to stretch the area why are you telling me to stretch the area because if I have a pulley that's already overstretched and you're telling me to stretch it out, that's not what my body needs. And this is where, you know, individuals have to take responsibility for themselves in a yoga class, that a teacher can only offer a guide for movement, but we as individuals have to know what our body needs and mm -hmm. where to apply that. As far as, um, you know, static stretching... I do like movement with stretching, I, but I, I think this idea of stretching is very rudimentary. Mm -hmm. And um, most people approach the concept of stretching as making longer than it was. Right. Making a tissue or a fabric, a muscle or a fascia piece longer than it was. And, and the body is much more dynamic and dimensional than that. And so one of the things in my teachings I've been working with is how do we shift our mindfulness to include dimension and depth in a single myofascial unit, in a, mm -hmm. in a single muscle, right? There can be um, pieces of fabric that are glued, adhered to each other. Um, you can have entire muscle groups that are adhered to other muscle groups. So you could have uh, your medial hamstrings and your lateral hamstrings glued to each other, you know, because you exercise all day, you know, in the mornings, and then you sit in a chair and you sit on your hamstrings and you dehydrate them and you squeeze like a sponge underwater. You squeeze the sponge, even though it's in water, right? It's dehydrated under the water because you're sitting on the hamstrings, pushing all the fluids out of them. And, and they were nice and warm, right? Mm. And that fascia was, was nice and sticky and movable in its sort of warmed jello form. And then it cools mm. and it cools in an adhered compressed 
platform. And so the hamstrings in that situation don't necessarily need to be lengthened, but mm. differentiated. Mm. Differentiated from each other, differentiated you know, from medial and lateral, and differentiated inside the myofasciculature, mm. inside the actual unit itself, that, that the actual hamstring unit becomes flattened and glued and so it needs to be fluffed like a pillow if you will and differentiated in the different pieces of paralleled angel hair pasta that gets stuck together mm, right mm. and so so our concept of stretching needs to change yeah. it needs to evolve to recognize what's actually happening to the form and and that to me is a becomes a product of putting the individual reduced anatomy components into a more systems concept right. and understanding how those parts relate to each other and when we understand how they relate to each other we also begin to understand the actual shape and form of the human body which allows us to communicate with movement and stretch mm. quote unquote stretch mm. in a more successful functional way wow Wow, what you're just saying about the hamstring makes me feel like I should stand up out of this chair right now. <laughs> uh, okay, so I have a question. Um, one of so, our final. So, so let me. I, I'll, I, I'll give you one more piece, and this is this is one of the the. This is appealing to everyone's vanity, right? Mm -hmm. If we stay in one position for 45 minutes, it takes our body seven and a half minutes to recover from that, mm. right? So your fascia, if you put strain on a piece of fascia by sitting on it for 45 minutes, it'll take your body seven and a half minutes to heal from that. If you stay in that same position, right, for 70 minutes, seven zero minutes, it'll take your body seven and a half hours to heal from that. Oof. So the damage that's done to the system, the aging that occurs from that damage from 45 to 70 minutes okay is exponential so the name of the game is get up and move and move dynamically you know, don't sit in one position at your desk for more than 45 minutes. Set an egg timer. Set the alarms on your phones. I don't care what you do, but get do up and Do not move. stay seated for hours at a time. Don't do any one particular action or behavior for longer than 45 minutes at a time. Wow. Change your movement. Yeah? We are a product of all the ways in which we move in our lives. Yeah? So, so move dynamically and don't stay static or put pressure on or strain on any one given part of the body for longer than 45 minutes. We're not designed for that. Wow. Thank you so much for offering that. I think that's probably the, the best bit of advice we've got <laughs> in this whole podcast, maybe ever, actually, in all of the podcasts combined. All right. So I just have one more question before we start to wrap it up. And that is, um, I would love for you to discuss maybe some of the archetypes that you see in um, bodies that kind of correspond to uh, our social way of, of holding ourselves. And then the other part of this question is maybe kind of what injuries do you see that are also, you know, corresponding to the way that we live our lives? And I guess my, my subtext to that question is, are, is the kind of epidemic of broken hips in senior citizens preventable? <laughs> okay. Um, I would say that, you know, one of the things that I forbid my students from doing is making generalizations. Mm -hmm. Because the second that you make a generalization, you lose the opportunity to meet the individual where they are. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm very um, I'm adamant against making generalizations. That being said, <laughs> um, I would say that 
one of the you know machines our machines are shaping our bodies in many many different ways that than we're used to um, for the older generations who had computers and personal computers you know phones uh, develop in their lifetime they went from having um, you know good postural alignments or or alignments around the behaviors they did on their regular basis to wrapping those bodies around these devices mm-hmm. as opposed to the youth now who are just developing with them right yeah. their their shapes their bodies their forms are developing around them um, so yeah I think that I think we're hanging our heads forward our heads are sort of like leading us like like weights like huge they they become like 100 pound weights like pulling the body forward in space mm-hmm. uh and and it's you know the shoulders sort of drape over the rib basket and the rib basket drops down to the the pelvis in the front and and our phone is sort of at the center of that and our computers are at the center of those those shapes if you will um I would invite people to recognize that they can be the master of their devices. Their devices don't have to be the master of them. Right. Uh, and there's plenty of Facebook posts and, and literature out there about better using your phone in a more dynamic and functional way. But they're reading that article hunched over. They're reading that article <laughs> hunched over, absolutely. Um, and what I, what I can say is this. One of the most successful ways that I've found to take responsibility for myself is to use my device as the mechanism to remind me. Mm. You know, we have calendars that we can set alarms 45 minutes, every 45 minutes, every day. And you can utilize it for anything, you know, checking your breath, checking your posture and you know, I invite you to not say change, you know, I want you to check so that you can develop a consciousness around the shapes that you're in, that you find yourself in when that reminder pops up on your phone mm-hmm. uh, and then make the change. But just develop consciousness and feeling, you know, sensation around, you know, the shape that that you're in. And in that way, I think... Um, we can begin to unravel the story of unconsciousness. Mm. And, and that's really the, the purpose of the course that I teach conscious embodiment is, is that we can begin to develop a, a dialogue with ourselves around the shape of our form. Mm. You know, what are we, how do we work? What is health? And, and how can I, participate in that dialogue Mm. you know how can i facilitate my body's tropisms towards health its own natural healing processes and how can i prepare my form how can i invest my form in to to arrive at old age in the most functional usable way possible Mm. um you know, and you know, so to go back to the question that you asked about, are broken hips preventable? It depends. It depends on, you know, a lot of different stories that are participated in throughout a lifetime. Mm. It depends on genetics, it depends on you know, a lot, but is it, you know, will our generation have a different relationship with, with broken hips compared to, you know, our grandparents? I sure hope so. Yeah. You know, I, I, um, but, but we'll see, you know, this is, this is a slow changing experiment that, that we're doing. You know, we've, the development of the human being was to roam, Mm. you know, we, we, lived in fields and forests and gathered food and hunted for food until we, you know, changed the use of the form for agriculture and and then industrialism. And now we're in this electronic age where we're, you know, 
humans are sitting most of their lives. Yeah. And, and really, we haven't figured out how to become fit for that life yet. Mm-hmm. We're, we're still learning what that means. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, but we have the tools... You know, we have the understanding and we, we have the ability to put those relationships together to develop the answer to those questions. How right. do we become fit for the life that we're living? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I guess I was, I was curious about the broken hip question just because um, of what you said about sitting in chairs and, and, and how, you know, people often bring up the point that, you know, in India and, and, others, and other countries, people squat. It's like a, a regular part of their kind of like, you know, bodily lexicon. And um, I can remember, you know, when I've catered or waited tables in the past, and the only thing after I've been walking on my feet all day and my lower back starts, the only thing that makes me feel better is to squat. And the pe- the looks that I get from my coworkers, even though I'm not doing it like in front of people in the in the in, on, in the dining room, it's it's interesting because it's so unusual and it's so it's so interesting that that kind of weirdness and people thinking that to to hold your body in that way is weird also feeds into you know um, an attitude about using the body in that way it's just it's 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 interesting that the squat you know which seems so important to the health of the hips is yeah. just not in unless you're in a yoga class it's just not in the lexicon of our culture which, which is really odd because um, I think it would eliminate a tremendous amount of issues that we have around digestion mm. and uh, elimination yeah. for that matter I mean the the anatomy is designed to, you know, defecation is designed to exist with the squat. It's when we sit that we actually pull a ligament um, against the intestines, making it more difficult for us to eliminate. Mm. And, um, you know, so the squat allows for that to happen. And the squat also creates a certain amount of space between uh, the femurs, the hips, and the spine. You know, if you imagine an action figure from the 80s where you could pull the legs out of the hip and there's a rubber band holding them together, and you imagine that there's another rubber band from the the hips to the rib basket, Mm -hmm. and you could potentially grab the rib basket and the legs and have the pelvis suspend between that fabric, Mm -hmm. right? You know, that, that's a, a concept that, that we really need to develop in our consciousness, especially as a culture of, of sitters, you know, that, that as gravity creates this compression from the, the head and the, the rib basket down onto the pelvis and then down onto the femurs, um, there becomes this gluidness in the dimension of the fabric between the legs and the diaphragm, mm. between the legs and the lungs, so mm. to speak. And, um, and that, that squatting creates a certain um, expression of expansion between those places, between the femurs, the, the, the pelvis, and the rib basket in the lower spine um, in a folded position. Mm. You know, there's a certain amount of space and... and um, and uh, expansion that occurs with the squat in, in that kind of folding that allows us to unfold mm-hmm. uh, in into uh, a standing position. Yeah, which is again evolutionarily a relatively new expression mm-hmm. uh, in 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 the human form, in a mammal form. Yeah, yeah, to yeah. Be, to be standing like this, so. We're still sort of developing into an upright place, but our machines are, are sort of bringing us back to, you know, our Neanderthal shapes. Yeah, they want to squat for sure. Yeah. Well, I, I hate to end it on a squat, but um, we might as well. <laughs> so the last thing that I just wanted to ask you is just to give um, the listeners an opportunity to, um, or give you, I'll give you an opportunity to share any projects that you're working on, your website, how people can find you if they want to. We're in this beautiful um, um, office space where you do your body work in Union Square in New York City. So if anybody is listening, so anyway, if you want to share, you know, what's going on with you and how people can learn out more, learn more about you. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, Jacob, thank you for giving me the opportunity to, uh, you know, spread some 
ideas out into the world. Um, yeah, if I teach in New York City and worldwide. Um, you can find me uh, on my website, www.zacharydasic.com. Um, Z A C H E R Y D A C U K. Uh, that's how you spell my name. And uh, you can find all of my teachings there. I have a blog where I talk about similar ideas, mm -hmm. um, which I'm happy to have you follow me along. And um, thank you very much for your ears and your time, folks. Yes, thank you, everybody. And thank you so much, Zach. It's been a really interesting interview. Be well. Right. You too. Bye-bye. Well, that concludes our interview with Zach Dasick. If you're interested in learning more about Zachary and want to perhaps book him for a session, you can go to his website, ZacharyDasick.com. Again, that's ZacharyDasick.com, and it's spelled Z-A-C-H-E-R-Y-D-A-C-U-K.com. Until next time, friends, bye-bye.